<laughs> Welcome to our last workshop before your full proposals are due, which is on April 8th. Um, if anybody has any questions about that, I'd be happy to take them now, but Tamara has sent out the template. It's a Word document. There's just a series of questions you fill in. Um, you really don't need to go past six pages. Um, they're very specific and pointed questions. We've been through all of the different workshops now, and so we hope you're enabled to be able to fill in all the different parts, the regulatory, the reimbursement, the intellectual property. Um, one of the most important ones it might is today, and that is um, figuring out what is the important um, work that you need to do under your funding. And so we're going to learn about this concept of killer experiment. And um, last, the last workshop on IP, IP and commercialization was a little bit more sort of lectury, a little bit less interactive. Um, this one is going to be a lot more interactive. Um, our speaker today is Stephen Snowdy. And uh, he has done a lot of consulting, and I'll get him to give you a bit of a background on himself, but he does consulting for the Coulter Foundation, and I think I've done maybe four different workshops, different sorts of Coulter College things, um, and gone through um, Steve's Killer Experiment workshop, and I think in particular the last one, the SBIR, C3I1, um, was really interactive, and the teams would, would um, talk about what they thought they should do under funding. And as we've sort of... Um, <coughs> You know, tried to keep the theme going throughout many of these workshops. You know, find out what your investors. Hi, Emily. Good morning. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, find out what your investors want to see, um, and then do do those experiments. Do you want to sit over here? Yeah. Oh, just because he's going to use the whiteboard. Oh, okay. Um, so, so we'll be very interactive, and you can talk about what problem you're solving and what your technology is, and then what you think you should be doing, and then. Um, you know, Stephen is really good at helping you kind of refine that and map that out. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it'll actually, if you remember back to the first workshop with Andrew DeMeo when we talked about the unmet need and the value proposition, it'll be a little bit more like that, quite interactive. So, um, you know, he's here now, he's here till six. Um, he's really good at this, which is why I, I brought him out here from Atlanta. And so please take advantage and uh, make sure you um, pick his brain. The other um, couple things that I want to show today is I have and Tamara sent these out, I have a milestone dashboard and a project plan template. And um, I like everybody to use that format. Um, number one, I like you to really think about what your milestones are and understand what you're trying to get to. And it just makes it so much easier for my oversight committee um, members when they're looking at something to just look at the same formatted um, set of milestones and, and the project plan on the same timeline. So it really helps them um, quite a bit. So um, I have your slides set up, and I'll run them when you need them. Okay. And so if you would like to give a bit of background on yourself, and then Sure. I'm Stephen. Um, I'm a scientist by training. Uh, back in 2003, I earned a doctorate in neurobiology. Uh, when I was getting my, as I did my PhD, I also did an MBA where I focused in finance. And when I finished my PhD, I went straight into industry in a venture capital firm where I was the second partner at the venture capital firm had never done venture capital before, had no idea what it was, had no idea how to do it, uh, but jumped right into it. Uh, we ultimately raised uh, $100 million, invested in 25 companies. Um, I did that for eight years. And right now I'm doing what a lot of venture capitalists do. I'm running the companies that I started. Because venture capital is so constricted right now, a lot of us who are in venture capital are having to step into the companies that we created and actually run them to help conserve money. So I'm running three companies right now. Two of my companies are drug companies. Uh, one is an osteoarthritis drug company that's in phase two clinical trials. One is a cancer company that is preclinical. The majority of my time though, was spent on a contact lens company called Visioneer. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, we are gonna talk about the killer experiment, but first uh, we're gonna talk about stakeholders because your stakeholders are just so important as you start thinking about your killer experiment. Okay. And just to have a stage on which to talk about stakeholders, we're gonna use uh, Visionary, uh, my contact lens company, which I started back in 2008. We invested in that company, and uh, we're still in it. We just sold our first product. Uh, so, you know, it's a really nice story that goes from beginning to end. <coughs> well, not quite to end yet, <coughs> but it is a nice story. Uh, does anybody know what Presbyopia is? One? 
Anybody else know what presbyopia is? The people here are over 40, uh, mm -hmm. probably know. We have uh, some ophthalmology yeah. people here. Yeah, he's the one that <laughs> For those who don't know, Cold stuff. presbyopia is the loss of ability to see things up close as you get older. It goes on all through your life, but you really don't notice it until you're about 40. And 95% of people over the age of 40 have symptomatic presbyopia. And all it means is that you can't see up close. I hope close. Up close, you can't see in front of your face. You just extend your arm. You your arm, something. well, there comes a time when your, your arm is no longer long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's when you go see the doctor. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about presbyopia first. So this is the front of your eye, and this is, we'll call this the middle, and then in the back of the eye, okay? On the very front of your eye, we'll say this is an object that's in front of your eye. You have a lens, okay, and this is called the cornea. This is the part of your eye that if you stuck your finger in your eye, you would touch this, okay? This is a lens and it bends light. Right behind it, inside your eye, is another lens, and this is called the crystal lens. Okay, and this also bends light. The way things should work in your eye is an object off of which light is bouncing goes through the front of your eye, the light gets bent, it goes through your crystalline lens, it gets bent again, and it comes to focus on your retina. Okay? And this is where the image forms. This is how normally this is how things work. When you're older, as you get older, what ends up happening is that this lens here, which when you're younger, it's nice and bendable, it's pliable, the muscles are really, really strong that cause this muscle to bend as you get older, this lens becomes less flexible and the muscles around it become weaker. So when an object is really close to your eye, it no longer has the ability to bend the light as much as it should. And so the light ends up not converging where it should on the back of that eye because this thing just won't bend far enough uh, to bring that light to focus. Okay. So this is an optical problem that occurs in cameras as well. And one of the ways of dealing with the need to focus, for instance, in an instant camera, is we put in something <coughs> called an aperture. And an aperture is a mask. Okay? So if you were to take something and put it right in front of you, and it's really blurry, but put something else in front of your eye in which you poke the tiny little pinhole with the needle, you'd be able to see this thing that's blurry in front of you. And the reason is, is that you're blocking these high incidence, high angle light rays that aren't being focused. Okay. So this is called an aperture. That's what an aperture does. And if you block these light rays, look what happens. What's left is the light that came through the middle and didn't need to be focused. Okay, That's what an aperture mask does. That's how instant cameras are able to focus on everything from near to far without actually having to change the focus as they use this aperture effect to do it. Okay, now that you understand how an aperture works, any questions about how an aperture works? Or how an eyeball works? <clears throat> okay. I'm gonna show you how our lens is designed. So if you look at a plot, where on the x-axis you have distance from the center. And on the y-axis you have power. Our lens looks like this. Remember, this is just a plot of distance from the center of the lens and power. Okay. So in the very center of our lens is the prescription that the patient needs to see distance. All right. 
As you move outward from the center of the lens, as you get out here, and this is only two millimeters to give you an idea of the scale here. This right here is only two millimeters. As you move outwards from the center of the lens, the power rises very rapidly, okay? And so what ends up happening is this is really blurry, and what comes through here is really blurry. All right, what comes through the middle is what the patient needs to see this is really well, okay? So what ends up happening is your brain, your visual cortex has this really amazing ability to block out blur that it sees. It will do whatever it has to do to get rid of blur. So if you take one eye on a patient and you blur them pretty bad and you leave the other one naked with clear vision, within minutes, and some people within seconds, the brain will start, start to block out that blurred eye. It'll just stop using it, shuts it off, because it doesn't want to see the blur. It would rather just shut the eye down than actually try to use a blurry image. And that's the exact effect that we take advantage of. Okay, so the way this lens works is that all of this area is blurred, all of this area is blurred and suppressed. Your brain just shuts it out. And what you end up with is only what's coming through the center of the lens makes it to your visual cortex in your brain and gets used. What we've done here is we've used the visual cortex to create an aperture inside your brain. And we've done it by using the visual cortex's ability to suppress blur. And this is just a contact lens. It's unbelievable. It's just a normal, daily disposable contact lens that you slap in your eye. At the end of the day, you throw it in a trash can. And you put on a new set every day. It's just like a regular contact lens. But it's using the brain to create this trick. Pretty extraordinary stuff. Everybody understand that? Cool science, all right? Let's move into the business. That's all great. So what do we do? We start a company. We'll call this VTI, which is Visionary Technologies. Who can tell me who our stakeholders are? Give me a stakeholder. Who's one of our stakeholders? The one with the patient, right? The patient's a stakeholder. another one? Doctorologist. Doctor. Well, we'll just call it ECP, which stands for Eye Care Professional. Okay? Who's another stakeholder? Mm -hmm. Lots of them, right? What's that? Usually it's company. Payers, right? Yes. Lucky for us, this is our payer. We're actually not even, we're not even, that's not even. For some companies it is, it's not for us. For us, this person is the payer. They buy the lenses from us and then they sell them to their patients, okay? So we don't really deal with insurance companies, but we deal with a payer and it's this person. Who's another stakeholder? about the FDA. Stay cool. They care what we're doing, right? Who else cares what we're doing? It's visionary what? Visionary. Visionary technologies. Who's another stakeholder? Who else cares what we're doing? Yes, very much so. We'll call that strategic. Now the strategic is both a competitor and a potential partner, right? Because there's another stakeholder here called an investor who eventually wants their freaking money back. I said we started this company in 2008. We've been holding the investors' money for that many years. Eventually, they're gonna want their money back, and a lot of it. Okay, so that's a stakeholder. If we sold this company, to this, one of these is strategic, which would be one of the large four companies, Alcon, Visticon, uh, Cooper Vision, and Bausch & Lohm, those are the four big contact lens companies. Then we pay our investors back when we sell, okay? 
So there's some stakeholders for you. There's probably more that we could name. That was a good start. So when we started visioneering, the problem we were trying to solve is that the current, now these are called multifocal contact lenses. Okay, and I'm just gonna, MFCL, multifocal contact lenses. There are multifocal contact lenses on the market today, but they perform very poorly. This should be a $4 billion market. So we should, you know, between all the companies selling these uh, contact lenses for people over the age of 40, there should be four billion in sales out there, but there's only 400 million. And the, what we assume to be the prime driver of that is that the current multifocal contact lenses do not work very well. Uh, the way that they actually design that lens, if you look at it face on, in the center of the lens is the power that the patient needs for near vision. Concentric to that out here, is the power that the patient needs for their distance vision. These are completely distinct separate zones. And so there are two images that come out of this content lens. And that's not the way we normally see. That's not how our vision system works. It's used to a single image focusing on the retina. And that's what we're looking at. These contact lenses give them two images and people have a really tough time adjusting to it. They can't read well and they can't see distance points. So these lenses just don't perform very well, and that was the problem we were out to solve. Notice that we focused on this stakeholder. And we developed the contact lens, put it through clinical trials. Lo and behold, unbelievably good vision with these contact lenses. Patients can see perfect at distance. They can see their iPhones. They can read up close. They can see their computer screen. That's near, computer screen is intermediate, and you know, looking across the street is distance. They can see all this stuff. We nailed it. But there's a problem. So you can imagine how dismayed we are when we go to the eye care professional and we say, we have a contact lens that revolutionizes the care of presbyopers. Isn't that exciting? Patients have perfect vision. Oh, snap. They don't care, okay? They just don't care. They say, yeah, that's nice. You know, patients aren't getting good vision out of these lenses. But we don't, it's really not that big a deal, even if you give them perfect vision, okay? The reason is that, well, yes, that is our stakeholder. The eye care professional is the gate to the patient. They decide what the patient tries, what the patient ultimately buys. Okay. If this person isn't happy, nobody's going to be happy because we don't really have a great way of getting directly to the patient. So what ended up happening is the eye care professional, after we got out to a larger group, so this company was started by a couple of uh, eye care professionals. And you know their assumption was if I give good vision, we're gonna end up with a successful company. And that's what we went on. But when we got out to a larger audience and started talking to a lot of eye care professionals, we got this, eh, eh, it's kinda nice. You're not fixing my problem. Can I ask what the price point would be? Uh, it would be to the doctor around 70 cents a lens. As opposed to what's the price? Same as the others, same as the others. Priced on par. All right, so after digging into this issue, what doctors told us is that for their average presbyopic patient who comes in to see them, and this data has since been published pretty well, it takes two visits to get a patient fit. Two visits and a lot of time. And even after two visits, they're only gonna be successful about 66% of the time in getting the patient to buy the lenses, okay? And most of the time, the patient is actually not gonna buy them from the ECP. They're gonna buy them directly from one of the large contact lens companies that is selling through a retailer like 1-800-CONTACTS or Walmart, okay? So, the patient pays the doctor one time for a fitting fee. They didn't 
come in two, three, sometimes four times to that same doctor under that one price that they paid the doctor. Very frustrating for the doctor, economically. Okay? Takes up a lot of their chair time. And then the patient turns around and doesn't even buy them from the doctor. They buy them from 1-800-CONTACTS or Walmart or Costco or somewhere else. So the doctor has lost money twice. They have no incentive whatsoever to fit patients into these contacts, even if it fixes the patient's problem. They know they're going to lose money on the fitting, and that's a really big deal. So a patient is paying them, call it about 150 bucks to get fit to a multifocal contact. And then that patient's going to be in there at least twice and about a 40% chance of leaving kind of pissed off and not happy. So a lot of practitioners, it's just not worth it to them. Why do it? The important point here is that we focus on the wrong stakeholder. Okay, Our killer experiment was probably right, at least half right, but our killer experiment wasn't addressing one of the key stakeholders' main concerns, and we didn't know it because we didn't talk to enough of them. Go ahead. So that program is multi-focal contact lenses that they need to hunt for us. Mm -hmm. But was that the same problem with your contact lenses? So, I'm glad you asked. If you're trying to fit this contact lens to a patient, you have two different powers to worry about. You have the distance, and you have the near power. And these are distinct powers. These are separate. They're prescribed on the box. You know, this might be a minus two diopters, and this might be a low addition for reading, or it may be a medium, may be a high. So you have permutations here, and inside the doctor's office, you, they have this big box, and they have all the powers in there. You know, minus one, minus 1.25, minus 1.5. For each one <coughs> of those, they then have different near powers low, medium, and high generally, sometimes more complex than that. And in the ideal world, these wouldn't affect each other, but they do. And so if you give a patient really good distance vision and they can't read, you bump them up from the low reading power to a mid reading power, uh, reading power, it messes up their distance vision. And what the practitioner has to do is find the right balance and compromise of what that patient is willing to do. And they don't know it. The patient doesn't know what they're willing to tolerate until they go home. And they try to play golf, they drive their cars at night, they do things like that, and they figure out, hey, this is not the right mix for me. I want to change these. That is why it takes so much time. And for a patient who has been wearing single vision, normal distance contacts for their entire life, if you take any of that away from them by trying to give them reading power, they hate it. They just hate it. And so the visioneering lens is different. Um, so I showed you that power <coughs> profile where it looks like this. And through the center here is the distance vision, and then all there, there's this increasing power that creates a bunch of blur. Well, the only part of our lens that has to be prescribed is the center, just the distance because the near vision is taken care of by this blur suppression that occurs out here in the blur area. So we don't actually have a near power in our lens because we accomplish the depth of focus, so to speak. We give them that reading power through such a different mechanism. So our lens is prescribed just like a really simple lens for somebody who's 20 years old. We don't have all the complexity. And so what ended up happening is very fortunate for us. When we did our clinical trials, one of the things that we kept track of was the number of visits it took to fit a patient and how much time it took in a chair to fit a patient. And for us, it's 20 minutes in a chair, one visit with a 90% success rate. Okay. What we just did is we made the fit profitable. And we had no idea that that's what was going to drive our success. No idea. It, we just got lucky, to be honest. But it was dramatic. So you drop in half or less than half the time that it takes to get the lenses to accept the lenses. And on top of that, you make that fit 
uh, economically attractive to the doctor. And then we said, well, the other way we're gonna make the doctor love this is we're not going to sell to anybody except for the doctor. So we won't sell the Costco, we won't sell the Walmart, we won't sell 2,800 contacts. We will only sell to the doctor who then turns around and sells it to the patient. So now the doctor is making money again. They make money on the fit because it's super quick and easy, they're, yet they're still charging $150, and then they make money selling the lenses to the patient. And so this turns out to be incredibly attractive to the doctor. Now we have solved the doctor's problem. We didn't set out to do that, it just worked out that way. The reason we didn't know this ahead of time is because we didn't talk to enough stakeholders. Okay, we talked to a couple who said, you know, these are these are doctors. They say, well, I just want to make the patient better. Nobody said anything about making money. I just want to make the patient better, so that's what we went after. But had we talked to more practitioners who own their own practices and understand the economics inside their practices, we would have gotten a different answer that would have said, you know what, I don't care if you give kind of crappy vision. If you can just get a minute and out of my office quicker, I'd be pretty happy. But unfortunately, we did we did both of those, so we got really lucky. Anybody have any questions about that? Yes. You, you, you have to go ahead. You said first you talked to the doctor and they were not interested. They just said, eh, it's okay. Why? Because we weren't solving the problem. But we did. I mean, well, we didn't question. know it at the time. What we were doing after our clinical trials is going to doctors and saying, hey, we have this revolutionary contact lens that gives vision better than any contact lens you can put on a patient who's press So you're saying you just didn't introduce it properly? We didn't the even have the other data on how fast they get fit and how much more successful it is. We had the data in our data set, but it's not something we had really pulled out to show them because we didn't really know that it mattered until we found out why they don't like to do these things. Do you anticipate any trouble with the kind of the strategic arm where now you're only selling to the doctor somewhere down the line where Walmart and 1-800 contacts are going to try to like break in on it because they're not getting a piece of the pie? Sure. So 1-800 contacts and Walmart could say we want those lenses, but we don't have to sell them to them. Mm -hmm. you can't force us to do that. So how do you assure your uh, customers that you're not going to so doctors are very concerned about that. It's very important to them. And we have a document that we give to the doctor and, and they actually sign it with us that makes it very, very clear that we're not going to do that. Ultimately, what will happen is we'll get sued. And we'll get sued first by 1-800-CONTACTS. And 1-800-CONTACTS will tell us that our distribution method of selling directly to the eye care professional only is anti-competitive and drives up prices. And maybe they win that, maybe they don't. This stakeholder here will be the dancing happiest people on earth when that happens, because it will mean that we've really hit it big. 1-800-CONTACTS will not care about us until we're hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. But when they do, it'll be a huge compliment to us. Any other questions? I guess so, how little is too little and how much is a good number for you to understand that that was the value proposition? Like how many doctors did you find me to speak? Probably 15 to 20. And it has to be the right one. So if you talk to <coughs> academic optometrists, they have no idea how the money flows. No idea. They're just out there treating patients. They, you know, Somebody gets billed, somebody pays, and the university makes money. You have to talk to the right ones. and. The right ones are doctors who are out there running their own practices. They understand the economics. They know where they're making the money, and they know where they're losing the money. And so it has to be the not, you know, the number is important, but even more important is the right one. You know, the right profile. You have to think about it carefully. Anybody else? Just for fun, is <clears throat> so how did that change the way that you structured your internal business, right? Because you. Imagine in one model thinking about the large players is I can sell directly to them or big distributors. And now you have a lot of one on one sales with individual practitioners. You have to market them and educate them, but how do you change your business? 
It didn't change our business. Um, didn't change the way we operate or the our intent. Our intent was always to sell directly to the practitioner okay. because we understood at least part of the problem there. There's a, a lot of litigation going on right now between 1-800-CONTACTS and the contact lens companies because the contact lens companies about a year ago, two years ago, came up with these things called universal pricing policies. Basically, it's a an agreement between them and their customer not to charge between or lower than a certain price. What that did is it cut out 1-800-CONTACTS because if a patient is at their doctor's office and that doctor can promise them that they won't find the contact lens for a lower price, they just buy it there. That really pissed off 1-800-CONTACTS and Walmart and Costco. So they all joined in a class action suit and they're all fighting about that now. The suit is over collusive pricing because what, what they're saying is that the four contact lens companies colluded to do that pricing policy and to set the floor. Uh, there's some evidence that that may be true. We sit outside of that frame, but our intent has always been to make sure that the doctor is making money on selling the lenses. What it did really change, though, is it changed the way we market. Because the way we were going to market to a doctor was, hey, we finally have a presbyopic lens that works. Right. Now, like, now that's like a little tiny yeah. thing in the bottom of the sales sheet, right. and then the, you know most of the sales sheet is about how much time it saves them and how high the success rate is when fitting our lenses because that's what matters to them. So for, for this group, as they do their interviews, kind of, I guess we have this parallel, I mean, what you're saying is, it wasn't just most that you were speaking to more doctors, but you were asking different questions, I think. I assume that's the case too, right? And what matters to you. Yeah, yeah, what matters and, and the reason it's so important to pick the right target for that question is you, you're gonna be selling to that person. You better understand what's important to them. And what they tell you is important to them should change the way you do things. You know, the way that we think about things in academics is not generally the way things work out in the real world. Money flows differently. And it's really important to understand the stakeholders and how they make their decisions before you, you know, start designing something like a killer experiment. We got lucky. Our killer experiment had the data set in it that we needed. But you know, that, that was blind luck. We could have went all the way through that clinical trial and never recorded the chair time. And that probably would have been the death of the company or pretty close to it. Maybe we'll get into this later, but like, so in our case, we are selling to a hospital, like uh, as opposed to a private small practice. So, and there are often like multiple stakeholders. So there's like the people who actually provide the care but don't pay for it. The people who receive the care but don't pay for it. And then there's like the business person who basically, uh, in, in the company, like uh, this business strategy advisor or someone who basically says, uh, you know, it's almost like purely economic, cold-blooded cold economic for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm curious like like uh, uh, what your experience has been, or if you could comment on like how we would play within the politics of all these multiple stakeholders, uh, or should we focus on literally the like the finance person? Uh, and, and you need to focus on the entire chain. You need to follow that product from the time it enters the hospital to the time it's thrown away. And talk to everybody who touches that product or makes a decision about it. Because even something like how something is disposed of in a hospital can change the way the person ordering does things. And so what's important is to understand the products flow from beginning to end and the money flow from beginning to end. And that takes talking to a lot of stakeholders. So I wouldn't focus on just one person at a hospital. You've got to talk to the doctor. You've got to talk to the person who's making the purchasing decision, people who are disposing of it, shipping it out if it's a useful medical device. You've got to follow it all the way through. Because any one of those people sitting around a table like this can say, great product, but in my department, we're not going to deal with it. And that shuts the whole thing down. So you need to follow that product all the way through its cycle. All right, we can talk about killer experiment, I guess, now that you understand why the killer experiment. Just one last question about your case. So I understand you're phase three right now, right? For which? For the lens. No, this is on the market. It's we on the market, We just started right? selling this a month ago. Oh, that's great. So the question still applies. So, I mean, the potential of sales of a company that's starting, like, like yours, um, Comparing to, let's say, Falcon or Bashalom offers you up to acquire a company, and they, of course, they have a huge uh, sales team, mm -hmm. not only in the U.S. 
how do you, I don't know if you guys reached out to them or if they reached out to you, how do you weight this decision? Like when it's time to maybe, with a good offer, let's move to a, I don't know, a different project or let's try to build this from scratch. I mean, how, how do the investors? So a lot of it has to do with this stakeholder right here. And you have to understand that stakeholder very well. What's important to understand about this stakeholder is that a typical <coughs> venture capital firm has a legal life of 10 years. Okay. This particular venture capital firm, mm, let's see, that. well that fund, that, a venture capital firm is composed of multiple funds. Each one of those funds has a 10 year life. It's a pool of, a fund is just a pool of money. So it's really important to understand that when they start getting at that 10 year end of life, they're really wanting their money out and they're not wanting to sit around and watch a company grow. So this stakeholder here wants to see sales growth before they throw their entire sales organization at something. So that's the balance to be had, is how far along do we have to get proving something to this person and does it map well with the timing of this stakeholder? And if you think about this, if that fund was started in two. 2007, that particular pool of money, the investment was made in 2008. By 2017, they want to be out of this, long out of it. So that means in 2016, we need to have them at the table talking because it takes a year to get a deal done. Ideally, you would just keep growing it. But, you know, there's a time limitation because of this. And there's also a point at which they start getting very nervous and aggressive uh, because they see it starting to affect their sales. And uh, so usually, hopefully, those things are at the same time. Any other questions about this example or stakeholders? Okay, let's talk about the killer experiment. So think about this. Think about the timing here. 2008, we did this investment. Okay, we're sitting in 2015 right now. We've been in this for seven years. This has consumed seven years of my life. Okay, that's a really long time. And the probability that this would have worked is very, very low, okay? Very few of these types of investments work because of all the unbelievable risks and all the mistakes that can be made. This, missing this part was, you know, that could have been a shot to the head for us, okay? We got lucky. Regulatory could have been difficult. We got lucky it, it wasn't. We, smooth, we went right through the FDA. Uh, Technology-wise, you know, this was just a concept. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of risk in that technology. It, it worked out for us. A lot of things have to happen just right for one of these to work. And we have finite lives, okay? There's only so many of these we can do in a lifetime. And the way we tend to view this in industry is the quicker I can kill a project, the better. Okay, so when we design an experiment, we design to kill. We design to kill the project. All right. For us, we thought the most important thing was the patient experience, the vision. So we designed a very rigorous clinical trial around that. Because if you talk to an entrepreneur, what's so important to us is to fail something quick and move on to the next one. Because we're only gonna get to do a few of these in a lifetime, and we need one of them to work. So the sooner you get on to that one that's gonna work, the better off you are. And that's why we design experiments to kill projects. How do you know when it's time to kill an experiment or to pivot? Like just to get to wrap it all together or just like maybe make the adjustments or something? So you have all these stakeholders, right? And you need to be talking to them to find out what they need to see to put their money into it. And that's kind of what the killer experiment is. Um, not every experiment has a solid conclusion. There's a lot of ambiguity sometimes. But ultimately, 
if you can't get something paid for it, if you can't get somebody else to put in the next pot of money, it's not going to go anywhere. It may be a great technology, but if nobody's willing to, to put in the next money that it takes to put it through a clinical trial or to put it on the market, you know, why, why bother? Um, our healthcare system is built on money. To bring a medical product to market, somebody's got to make money on it, or they're not going to invest the money in it. There are exceptions to that, but very, very, very few, okay? And so your job is to make sure that the next pot of money can be had by understanding exactly what it is they want to see. If when you give them that data, they say, no, even if the data is okay, there, there are times when the data is decent, something says this probably will work, but it's not strong enough for them to say, I'm going to put my money into it. And so it's kind of a judgment call. You know, it depends how bad that no is. You know, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, that's sort of, uh, that's okay data. We need to do this experiment to understand, you know, to, to better understand whether this is worth doing. So it's not always black and white. It, it does require judgment calls. And the best way to get at those gray areas is to have somebody very, very independent who's not emotionally attached to it, who's not emotionally invested in it, uh, to say, I wouldn't do it. Seems like you're, uh, you have a PhD, so maybe just this could be useful for this audience. Is compare and contrast your design of experiments as a student versus your design of experiments, just if there's any less need there between what you're well, Let's, let's talk about those. the killer experiment sure. a minute. And so like I said, the killer experiment is meant to kill a project before significant resources are put into developing and perfecting the technology. Okay, can I do an experiment today that will tell me with a very strong yes or no whether this is likely to be able to move on to the next step and get the funding that it needs. Okay, so the killer experiment depends very heavily on who you're trying to convince of something. Okay, that's why it takes such careful stakeholder analysis. When you talk to your stakeholders, you may end up with an experiment that's in vitro. You could end up with something that's in animals. It could even be something that's in humans. You know, that's like the worst case, right? Somebody tells you there is no in vitro, there is no in vivo you can do, no experiment you can do to convince me that I should put my money into this until you do humans. And that's where a lot of academic projects die because who's got the money to, to do a human clinical trial? You know, sometimes it can be done in the university, sometimes there are grants available to do this stuff, uh, but generally you're going to need a corporate partner to do that. So if they come and tell you that, you know, you're going to need to get through phase two before we buy that one, because we've seen too many of them fail. You know, that's, you, you got a tough decision to make about whether to put your own time, your resources into that project, uh, when you can only do a few projects in a lifetime. One thing that is extremely important in killer experiments is the control. And, you know, to some extent, the, the experiment itself. Like I said, everybody has a different view of what they want to see before they're convinced that something is likely to work. You as a founder or as an inventor, inventor especially in academics, sees that next ex experiment as something, hey, it gets me to publication. You know, that might be your goal of a killer experiment, which generally is not something that's going to work for one of these folks to put money into you and to, to pay for that next thing that needs to be done to prove that something is going to work. So when you're designing a killer experiment, talking to all these people is, is really, really critical. And controls are just so important. Controls are going to tell that next funding source more about your, ex your project or your product than anything. Yes, the active that you're testing is very important, but the controls are super, super important, okay? You need to be able to look at the data at the end of this experiment and have no doubt that whatever effect is seen or not seen is due to your exact invention. And so having the appropriate negative controls, having the gold standard out there, uh, and you know, trying to work that into your experimental design are super, super When you talk to a doctor 
about what is what would be convincing to them. What you're generally going to hear from a doctor in designing an experiment, two things. What they see in the literature, and if they're consulting for large companies, what those large companies are doing. Okay, that's generally what you'll hear from a doctor. And this is, you know, it's good knowledge to have. If you talk to a company, you may hear something completely different. A large company could even say, we, we know what experiment needs to be done, but we're not going to tell you. Because the experiment itself and how we test that, we consider proprietary. Uh, cardiovascular companies, cardiovascular devices, these companies are notorious for doing this, where they'll say, that looks like a great product. Um, I understand you want to run an experiment to convince me of something, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. If you give me the device, I'll take it into my labs, I'll test it, and I'll tell you whether it meets our specs or not. And you should you know, be prepared to do that. You may not have to run your killer experiment. Somebody else may do it for you. Uh, but in general, they'll, they'll kind of tell you what they're going to need to see to be convinced that they should put their money into it. And you want the most rigorous test possible because you want to be able to convince them with no doubt that this works. And if it's not going to work, you want to know it early in your life rather than later in your life, right? So you can move on to the next one, okay? Any questions on, on that part? We'll go through a couple of examples here and talk about this stuff. Did I address your, your question on how yeah. we think of things differently in academics versus the real world? Okay. We're not thinking about publishing, we're thinking about killing. Right, so we don't spend our life on it. <laughs> I don't think about the idea of like open, yeah, like, <laughs> and the other element I think sometimes I hear is like the idea of pursuing some sort of open-ended questions. It's like the lead to the next thing to study. Um, you know, yeah, I, an experiment, a killer experiment is not a test of an incremental change. It's not a test of a mechanism of action. Uh, it is the data on which you would want to say, I want to spend the next 10 years of my life working on this. That's what you're trying to get to. And meanwhile, you're also trying to make sure that when you structure this experiment, that you're going to convince somebody who matters. And generally, the, the one that matters is the, the one who's going to be writing the next check for the development. Okay. Would you <clears throat> rely on ISO tests or anything like this to choose or kill an experiment? If all something is doing is meeting ISO, it's probably not revolutionary enough to really matter. Um, ISO testing is going to be important from a quality control perspective to make sure it meets the minimum standards of something new. But you know, it's it's not going to be the data that tells a company, wow, that's worth putting a hundred million dollars into. If you can do something under ISO standard grade, that 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 can be helpful. No, ISO doesn't. Say anything about killer experiments? Just no, safety. no, it's just safety and um, quality control. Yeah. yeah. So it's you're generally going to need a lot more than we, that. We but have, we have one project that we're funding now, and I'm not sure if this is what you're referring to, but um, it's an antimicrobial coating technology, and so um, they did they outsourced the testing at a lab, and we did certain experiments, and then we talked to strategic. And they thought it was interesting, and we said, well, what would you like to see? And they said, well, we'd like you to do the, this experiment to address this particular issue. Um, it, again, it was an in vitro experiment that we could do at an ISO lab. So they did that, and then it came back very, it turned out very good, and so now they have it in-house in under an MTA where they're testing in their own models. So, but in that case, um, you know, we got exact feedback on exactly what they wanted to see, and we did that. And then also um, having it done in an outside lab um, is very, very objective. And um, you can really you know, sort of rely that, that, again, going to the quality that the data is very high quality, maybe even they can send the samples blind or what have you. Um, it, it does happen more often in an academic lab than at a contract lab that it's hard to reproduce the data as well. And we're, so. we're gonna talk about that in one of the examples that we do. So if we go forward one. All right, so this is just a case discussion, just as an example. Um, have they watched the video of the talks? No, no. Uh, just as an example. So somebody has developed a nanoparticle that is composed of a liposome, a targeting 
moiety on the liposome, so a small protein that targets it to something, and a chemotherapy drug. What are the appropriate experimental groups? Okay. So the idea is you put this into an animal, you're testing its ability to cure cancer in an animal. What are the groups of animals? Somebody give me one. No treatment. No treatment, so you need a <coughs> negative control. Right, completely negative control where nothing is done. All right, so there's one Kaplan liner. Liposome carrier. Just the liposome. Yeah. It's another one. And the drug. The drug by itself uh -huh. is another one. Okay. Anything else? Drugs. Positive control. Kind of standard of the care if available. If available. Because any data that you generate, it's very important for the consumer of that data to be able to look at it and put it within context of something that they've done before, especially in industry. So if they've ran that cancer model before with one of their drugs, they kind of want to see their drug in the group so that they know how to calibrate the data of what it should look like. Okay, so we have the empty particle, we have the drug by itself, okay? And we have a positive control and a completely negative control. What else? Liposome plus drug. Yeah, liposome with drug in it, but no targeting. There's five. Any more? It's the matrix of <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So you have eight groups of animals here because then you have to do you have to do the targeting moiety by itself. You have to have the liposome with the targeting agent in it, but no drug. Then you have to have the contemplated actual product. Okay. So in an actual Poulter project, um, and I was not on the group that funded the project. Uh, I came on afterwards. Somebody showed data, and it was not in cancer, it was actually in a spinal contusion model in the rat, where they're trying to heal spinal contusions. Somebody developed a polymeric um, particle that they were putting drug into. And their control was saline. Well, that's kind of nice, um, and it worked great. It worked fabulously well at healing these, these spinal contusions and making rats run again. Uh, what we asked for after that was that they use the polymer by itself and even the monomers that they use to make the polymer to make sure that the effect was coming from you know the delivery of the drug that they were putting inside and not something from the particle itself. Lo and behold, six months later, they come back to us, and the polymer itself, non-particle, worked just as well as what they were thinking about, or what they tested before, which was the drug packaged inside this polymeric particle. So that takes and makes the potential product here much more attractive, actually, because instead of dealing with the FDA on a delivery system, you're actually just dealing with a new polymer that seems to have these anti-inflammatory healing effects. So sometimes the killer experiment can actually make your project much, much better by killing it. Okay? Because that project was dead, but it gave birth to a new project, which were these anti-inflammatory polymers. So this is an interesting one, and um, this is a novel small molecule against glioblastoma multiforme, which is an absolutely horrible uh, brain cancer disease, six months from diagnosis to death, high, high medical need uh, for this particular product. The small molecule, because it's, it's very lipophilic, must be packaged into liposomes uh, to be able to deliver it and uh, obtain sufficient plasma dwell. Uh, plasma dwell being how long something actually circulates in the body. So uh, they did a bunch of rat studies. Uh, they cured a bunch of rats with brain cancer. And the study was published in Science. This science paper is so locked tight, it is almost impossible to criticize it. You know how science papers are. They're just, the controls are just so well done that you read this paper, which takes about a week to get through the three pages, 
because it's just so <laughs> dense. You get through it and you think, there's nothing that they left out, just nothing. It is just so tightly done. Who wants to take a guess at what the killer experiment is? So you take this science paper. The time resources required to manufacture the model. No. Super simple, two-step synthesis, unbelievably cheap. So when they start treating the tumor, they treat it a very early stage or tumor already? Uh, they, they treated established tumors. So they inoculated the rats with uh, RT2, which is a, a very aggressive rat brain cancer uh, in the brain. And the results were just unbelievable. Uh, these rats, the, using the best standard of care available for these rats, they lived 40, not even 40 days before they died. With this drug, at 200 days, they were alive and well. They were cured, essentially. This killer experiment phase one? Nope. Drug alone? Oh, they did. Their controls are a lot tight. How did they Can't. deliver? Huh? Which route to deliver the drug? Human beings. <laughs> well, that'd be nice. But there's something that the companies and investors want to see before that. No I no guess. No yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> IP injection? Nope. Versus a You're thinking little. science. Uh -huh. You're like science. Science. Somebody somebody else, somebody else. Somebody else. Somebody So the killer experiment <laughs> is something that was just mentioned a minute ago. What companies want to see and what investors want to see is they want to see the data duplicated outside of a lab, outside of the, the university. They want, to go, they want to take this, put it into a private company and private lab, and let them run it. Okay. So this technology was licensed out of the university. And the very first step was to manufacture the small molecule in an outside setting. So you go to a, you know, a, a synthesis lab, an organic synthesis lab that's private, you know, probably up in Jersey, because that's where they all are, Jersey or Boston. And what happened here is the synthesis lab followed the science paper to the T and tried to make that drug and couldn't. They got a little bit. They got about a 2%. The best they could do is a 2% yield and not even pure. They couldn't get it, couldn't get it cleaned up. What they had said in the science paper was that they got 95% yield with 95% purity in a super simple synthesis. Okay. But that very first killer experiment, the very first one, didn't even really make it into the killer experiment. The very first effort at trying to duplicate it, they couldn't make the drug. So they called up the professor at the university, and they said, hey, we're having a lot of trouble making this, this molecule. This is tough. Uh, the best we can do is a 2% yield, and it's really sloppy with a lot of other stuff in it. It's about 95 plus percent starting material following your procedure. Now, what's important to realize is that it changes color when the reaction happens. But even in a 2% yield, where it's 95% starting material, it did change color. And so they called up the, the PI and said, hey, can you send us your most pure sample of that drug you've ever made so that we can run it on a column and see what it's supposed to look like on a column. So the professor sends the best they ever made to the reference lab. Guess what? 2% product, 98% starting material. Okay. Something in there was working on the animals, right? Mm -hmm. Probably the starting material. It would be great if that starting material were patentable, but it's not. It's, it's public domain stuff. You buy it at same time. Okay. Pretty important. So sometimes the killer experiment is as simple as letting somebody else do the data. Okay, because you just know the magic water problem, the magic grad student problem. Uh, sometimes if something is really extraordinary but it stands to really uh, be valuable, some, they're going to want to redo the, that work. The killer experiment is going to be, okay, the university is going to hand over a protocol to an outside company, and it's the scariest thing in the world for professors to do this, 
where they just hand over a protocol and say, try to do it. <laughs> it's really scary. Now, this was, was a it? brand new molecule, never been made before, so it was not. It out wasn't of the part of like hundreds of thousands of compounds. It was not. Didn't come out of the screen. It was. Uh, but how did it come out? Design. Yeah, but based on. So that the reason they did it this way is the starting material was known to have anti-cancer effects, but it was not patented. Because it couldn't be patented, nobody wanted to develop that starting material as a drug. There's no way to make the money. And they knew this from the Oh, yeah. So what they did is they changed oh, that God. molecule a little bit, which is fine. You can do that. And yeah. the idea was to not affect the efficacy of that molecule too much, but be able to come up with a proprietary compound that, you know, is worth putting through a clinical trial. Because if something's not patentable, it's generally not worth putting through a clinical trial. Because there's no way to recover that money because as soon as you get through a phase three clinical trial, somebody else is gonna say, okay, that looks great, I'll start selling that product too. All I have to do is prove that I'm manufacturing the same thing, it's a generic. And you can't recoup the development money if you can't own the market. And it's just an unfortunate fact of the way things work in medicine. If somebody can't make money from a product, they're not gonna put it. It doesn't make sense to put the investment in to develop it. So what they did is they made a small change to a molecule they knew to be it effective. Yeah, the molecule itself didn't matter. It they never really made it. They never really And so now that project steps back from being, you know, hey, this has great animal data, great IP around it, easy to manufacture to, nobody has any idea what it is. It may work in animals, it may not. It, it starts off now as just a completely de novo project. Nobody knows <coughs> Okay, so sometimes, you may not want to hear it, but the killer experiment is going to be to hand it off to somebody and let them test it. Okay, okay. so key points here, a uh, successful killer experiment will substantially remove the risk and leave no doubt that the product will be an improvement over what's been used which requires very careful design. It requires a tremendous amount of stakeholder discussion to find out what's gonna be convincing. And the most important stakeholder is the one that's gonna put in the next money. And the next most important stakeholder is the inventor. Because you want to kill something and move on to the next one, if that's what you need to do, okay? Don't be afraid of killing something because if you get a result that definitively says kill it, then you've succeeded. You just saved 10 years of your life. And you move on to the next one. Okay? Any questions? Discussion? What's the value of, you see, like market secret when in, in the pharma industry? Very little. Because they can reverse engineer. They can that, reverse engineer, especially if it's something chemical. Okay. The analytics, you know, are so good now uh, that smart. it's super, super easy to reverse engineer something. Something like a contact lens. You know, we do have this patented, mm -hmm. but the technology does not exist to take a floppy, wet contact lens and reverse engineer the optics of it. And so there is value there because there's just no way to reverse engineer it. Uh, but anything that's chemical, there's nearly no value at all. So let's talk about uh, some some projects, maybe. Does anybody have a killer experiment that they're contemplating? I just have one idea. <laughs> Was it because of this or because? Because of <laughs> You want to tell us about it? Yeah. So I'm trying to come up with a uh, with a prototype, with a test to confirm uh, newborn screening for cystic fibrosis, and it's the whole setup that you know will measure sweat rate. So that's like the, the making. But sweat one rate. Of, yeah, how how you sweat, and it's the actually the flow of water coming out of the skin. Okay. 
after you stimulate with a specific drug that activates CFPR, which is the defective uh, protein in the CF. But what I was thinking is maybe including in this um, the proposal that we could have two prototypes and then have a different center to test other individuals and see if we can uh, obtain the same results. Well, the first is to make it work in your hands. Yeah, right, right. right. Like, and then after at that, the end, like the at this the last cycle, we could, yeah. you know, instead of just using the same, but just having exactly uh, the, the same prototype and have a collaborative center. And we do have centers that, you know, are, are affiliates. We have a total of overseas, like seven, 700 patients in Seattle. So we can have one of the collaborative centers to pass in a few patients in different centers to kind of validate uh, and it, and after we yeah. prove And also to improve your your protocols. Um, because what you write as a test protocol may work for you, but it's missing some really small thing that's really important. And when somebody else goes to read it, it may not, you know, you, you may need to improve it. Right. You know, there may, they may sit there and say, well, this doesn't make any sense. There's a step missing or something. Oh, right. yeah, okay, got it. Well, we need to Like a different that. set of eyes. To look yeah, that. and so that's important. The, the blindedness of it is super, super critical for credibility. So in academics, we tend to work with the people we know. We kind of tell them what to do. Uh, we go there, we supervise them doing it. It just defeats the purpose. The further away they are from you as collaborators, and the more blinded yeah. They are. I know, but then if, if I know, because it'll be sometimes you can't avoid it because it's a small community, but yeah. the, the more blind it is, it kind of sees you because you're collaborative. But the problem is, if I try to find somebody in the East Coast, it will involve more money, right? Because they have to, this has to be funded somehow. Yeah. At least a good start would be a different set of research team, different people be actually performing the tasks. But you, you also don't want to do. When you're thinking about a killer experiment, you really want it to be killer. Um, you want it to be as rigorous as you can. Uh, you know, if this isn't going to work, you want to know. Yeah. So maybe, Danielle, you could think of some things, for example, just one idea. You could um, you know, send them their clinical trial materials, and instead of the sweat-inducing drug, it's saline. Or have a CRO you know do that. Yeah. So you can actually have somebody else, a uh, completely independent group, doing the blinding so that even you're blinded. That's the way they're doing. Blind yourself by using an outside group. Cost a little bit of money, but yeah. not a huge amount. And with the IRB do yeah. Well, I mean, there are ways to do that. You can do crossover designs or something like that. I mean, you know, they could they could actually it's test the two research things. in yeah. But just, I mean, you know, it's just one idea. We could, you know, think about no, no, ways yeah. to yeah. control. Yeah, I, yeah. I do have a, a, actually a drug that is a control. Uh -huh. that, yeah, it, that goes into more details. But uh, but I have ways to, to have a control. Like what, after you're talking about how important it is to have controls, and definitely have ways to stimulate sweat that's unrelated to CFTA. In fact, but it's a different drug. And all you're trying to do is. So you're developing something to measure the rate of sweating. Yeah, yeah. Because CFDR is in our sweat glands, and so CF patients are unable to sweat by this other rigid pathway. Why do, you, why do you have to give a drug to do that? Uh, why can't you use a warm spotter? Right. I, I do measure the, the baseline first, and then um, we just do an injection from the skin to stimulate sweat by uh, activating so CFDR. Shutting down the cholinergic factor. That's how we sweat. So that sweat is a is specific to the, the disease. It's the function of CFTR. Yeah. So it's like a biomarker of the disease. So it can be done. It can be used for clinical trials. For example, if you have a new drug. What are you measuring system. exactly? Water or salt? Is the water lost to the skin? So the water loss is lost to the skin. Yeah. It's in the vasculature. So it's just a chamber that it's able to detect the water that goes through that chamber. And the, and the amount of sweat is related to disease load, essentially, or severity, because there's so many different mutations. So it's mutations. not binary. No, it's that there's it's a whole range. Yeah, <coughs> there's a range. Well, hopefully. So it's, it's, uh, like a little cup on the skin. Anybody else have a, a killer experiment to think about that we can play for? I don't know if I'd be killed or not. <laughs>
Okay, we propose to do something similar as you mentioned with a, a gel material I developed. It's a one pattern already filed. And uh, there's a, the, the product for this one, it's a combination, it's a drug, it's an FDA approved drug for cancer treatment, but I use it for the tissue repair. So it's a combination of material and uh, drug. It's a hybrid material. For it's the, a hydrogel? It's a hydrogel. So for the cartilage repair. So the killer experiment should be animal model for sure. I have done the rat model. The result, because due to the size is too small, it's almost impossible to give me a very conclusive result. So for me, um, I propose the next the killer experiment in my scope of capability is a rabbit. But even the rabbit in the in the industry, they also have a little doubt, right? Because That's rabbit right. has a little tendency to heal spontaneously. So I don't know what's, you know, if I say sheep, kind of a joke, right? <laughs> Already moved to the large animal. <laughs> no, it's, that's fine. If ultimately what's going to convince a company to put money in this mm -hmm. is a sheep, mm -hmm. then why mess around with rats and rabbits? expensive. Uh, but generating data that nobody believes is even more expensive. <laughs> it's a waste of money. Uh, so if the, if the only thing that you're going to get out of a rat and rabbit is convince you yourself you should do a large animal, yeah. you're stuck in the same boat. Sometimes the with a large animal you can do experiment. many test sites. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know about sheep and tendons, but I've done them skin, Oh yeah, example. because Pigs have like like a lot like of skin, uh, so Christy mentioned. I already tested this concept, the combination of the drug and the, the material. It's quite successful in bone repair. So I just uh, switched the different combination I want to propose for the cartilage repair. Is that a count? Because I have a confidence in the, in the bone, and I have a kind of confidence in the ligament. So for the, the, the cartilage, is obviously there's a unmet need. There so is an unmet the... need, and it's a completely different problem. Yes. yes. Um, so have you talked to people in industry about what would convince them that I, this is going to yeah, work? Yeah, definitely. I just came program. back from an uh, orthopedic research meeting uh -huh. last night. So I talked to biomed people. They are, believe me, they don't have very clear ideas. Say, yeah, you have to have the, oh, yeah, for your scope, maybe Rabbit data, for now, is good enough. You show us the rabbit data. That's what they say. But they definitely say, oh, maybe next step we'll go to horse. Yeah. Um, well, the nice thing about horse is there's a natural, uh, there's a natural progress of osteoarthritis exactly. in a horse that yeah. is a little more closely reflective of a degenerating joint. Exactly. They are doing, they are testing their um, current product in the horse in Kentucky. So that's why. Is probably. this something that you just squirt into the synovial joint? Yeah. And so it's not something where you're actually remodeling the cartilage. You're not attaching anything to the cartilage. Actually, the, actually it's both. <laughs> so I'm kind of. Uh, you're not sure yet. Not sure yet. Uh, ideally, should, because my gel can actually attach to the defect site. So if I, were, if I were looking at this in terms of what would convince me that it's going to work in a human, mm -hmm. I'd really want to see it in an osteoarthritic yes. setting because yes. of the inflammatory milieu that exists inside of an osteoarthritic joint or a post-traumatic joint. Yes. Um, so my curiosity would be, so you, you, even if you attach this to the cartilage, uh, and you're supposed to grow cartilage, I guess, back in somehow, um, what would be really important from my perspective is, does it work in a setting where the osteoarthritis is already ongoing, and you have all these yeah, inflammatory this, uh, my, mediators there? Uh, my, actually, next study, I already have the uh, animal protocol proved it's a guinea pig. It has a spontaneous osteoarthritis, OLE model. So I like to, it's kind of like a two step. First, can I take care of the inflammation? And second, what we look at So you're the, actually gonna measure inflammatory mediators exactly, there? Exactly, yes. The so what's the mechanism of action here? It's the inhibit of the T cell, B cell, but also okay. um, doing the 
uh, demethylating, so can actually activate um, the trust differentiate. Why not use the rat municipal tear model? So you go into a rat, you tear the Cut, meniscus, yes. it destabilizes the joint. And they get this very rapid, within a month, uh, degradation of cartilage. Okay. And if what you're after, what you're trying to show is that you're interfering with the inflammatory pathway that uh -huh. degrades the cartilage, then that may give you uh, some signal that you're actually doing that. Because if, you know, in that rat meniscal tear model, if you stop the degradation of the cartilage, it's because you shut down the, the inflammatory pathway. But for the uh, guinea pig, for the old, old guinea pig, it's already developed. When I get it, I can just give a shot right away. I even don't need to that's wait a, for a month. That's a pretty rigorous test because, uh, well, how do you how do you measure the cartilage thickness? You sack the animal and, yes. and yeah. cross section. Yeah, I'm just just saying that. Yeah, that's just a one thing guys control. And is your hope that you gener regenerate the cartilage or you stop the degradation of the cartilage? Definitely, I hope to measure that stop the uh, degradation. And uh, probably longer time, look at the regeneration. Yeah, that would be that would be big if you could do that. Stop the degeneration. That'd be, that'd be pretty big. Yeah, that model actually is well, well established. You know, like a time course, like a that string, four months start. You know, let, let's have a nice correlation to look. Ultimately, published. though, you don't want to do an experiment that's not going to convince me to put money into it. So you really need to understand. What so you have you have specific feedback from Biomet, right? On what model they want to see? Can you from, for, yeah, for them right now, this is a rapid model. For them. Have you but, talked about the guinea pig model with them? No. They in their mind, it's a rabbit. You know, like probably horse. like a another you know, horse. And it, it it would probably make sense to talk to some others as well talk to Bioventus, which is uh, Smith and Nephew's biologics group. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be a good one to talk to some more biologics. I guess I just got thought, but there still ought to be some people around there sure. that you can talk to, like Ed March Harrison, who's the head of biologics, and some more biologics. Uh, but talk, talk to a few. Okay. Thanks. Who else? Say that again. Uh, it's uh, to combine the uh, intravascular ultrasound and intravascular photocopy image to image the vulnerable plaque of the coronary artery. So okay. now for auricular experiment, maybe uh, we will, uh, maybe in the demonstration experiments, we will um, image the human cadaver in samples and also we will, we, we will um, uh, do the Experiment on the rabbit model with um, like a hyperlipidemic. Yeah, with the with some high fiber diet or something. Or something. So, if you were an image company, I guess that's who would buy this. Is an imaging company, or who would? Is this a? Yeah, yeah it would be like um, um, sort of uh, taking IVIS technology and adding additional functionality to it. So the photoacoustic imaging, um, with the ultrasound um, modality, they can measure um, thickness of the fibrous capsule of the plaque. And with the photoacoustic imaging, they can tell the lipid load. So the high-risk plaques are ones with thin fibrous capsules and with a big lipid load. So you'd identify high-risk plaques from low-risk plaques and determine interventions. So companies and like that Volcano... that already and accepted? That with that knowledge, it changes your therapeutic course? Um, yeah, so I'm not sure. I think they try to sort out, do imaging and sort out what, what plaques to do interventions on and which ones are stable. And are they still trying to sort that out? I don't know. Do you I know? Think, I think broadly, I think that the, the sense I get from literature is that it's, so it's not broadly accepted for current rapid technology that it's a requirement and commonly used. So, but in some places, I think in Japan, I just came in as a necessary thing and I think volcanoes marketing other cost control, so people are over deployed stents, mm -hmm. so they have to meet some threshold criteria under IVIS before determining. That's that. based on this information? Or this information could be used for that I think this information could be used for that, because I think the information is incomplete uh, now, or it's, it has room to improve, so it still needs additional clarification. So I think 
right now they have this ability to assess and identify plaques. They know that the plaques are there. I think their assessment of that is still is a weak part of that technology today. So it's incomplete in the current models. Um, it doesn't perform well. Yeah, I think for our, uh, for the technology, the technology to combine the intervascular photoacoustic another imaging modality is that it can have to um, image the size and this distribution of the big core, which cannot be done by the iris technology currently in the market. So, um, so maybe uh, for our technology before the international procedure, we can to uh, fully uh, evaluate the vulnerability of the plant to determine whether we need uh, an international, uh, international procedure to put a stone there or not. Uh, because for some plant, it's, uh, it's, how, it's very stable and maybe and it's, not, it's also not a flow limiting, so maybe we do not need to put a stand there. And also during the procedure, uh, procedure it can also can get and uh, uh, provide guidance for the, um, for the stand or under capacity procedure. So if you talk to an imaging company on what they would want to see here? Imaging company? Because that's who would put the next money in, right? <coughs> I assume. Um, so you, as you think about what you want to show, it's really important to have an understanding of who you're going to show it to and understand what they want to see. Maybe the uh, interventional cardiologist would want to see. Do they want the interventional cardiologist is not the one who's going to put the next pile of money into this. An imaging company is going to put the next money into this. And a cardiologist can tell you, uh, and it's a good thing to do, is ask them what they would do with this, uh, where they would put it into their decision making for care. But you really want to convince the next funding source that this is worth doing. And so it's important to understand what they want to see. Because, you know, first of all, they're going to understand you know, pretty well what the cardiologist wants to see or the interventional person wants to see out of this. Uh, and they can probably give you really good guidance on what they would need to see to convince them that they should put their money into this. And that's why I started off asking, is this accepted? Is, this, is it accepted that what you would be showing enables a medical decision? Because if it's not accepted or if it's controversial, then uh, you know, the, the world just may not be ready for you yet. And, and that's an important thing to know if the world's not ready for it yet. yet. Anybody else have any? So we do, um, we developed an instrument method uh, for uh, enhancing the segmentation of tissues during the surgery. And we were aiming for the prostate cancer uh, surgery type and uh, in particular for minimal invasive surgery because it's a booming market so, so um, we we had an initial seek funding from uh, intuitive surgical the da vinci robotic surgery tool and um, we are now performing you know we have a prototype for open field surgery so it's not for minimal invasive yet and we are performing tests on, uh, on canine samples um, undergoing you know Spay, ovarian, hysterectomy. So okay. it's from these results, we can distinguish different tissues, but we're doing it from far away. Uh, eventually, when we do new invasive surgery, everything is going to be zoomed in closer, and the surgeon will be, would like to be able to separate uh, neural tissue from muscle tissue across the prostate to enhance functional outcome of the surgery. This is going to, to be the turnkey, I think, at least according to surgeons. That's what we would like to see, uh, you know, enhanced functional outcome for uh, this kind of surgery. So, what we are thinking was to initially take some tissue samples from a surgical room and try and image them and see if offline, so like on a, on a tissue segmentation, we can separate the different tissues. Would that be an okay here experiment? And then what's, eventually, what's the control? Well, uh, They do, uh, they, do, do they do direct visualization just through a, scan, a camera today, and then they, uh, uh, it's a lot of this training and history and knowledge of anatomy, but there's no other visual cue that they can see besides kind of some structural version before making that intervention, making a cut, 
but they usually know they know after they've made the incision whether or not they hit the nerves or not. And it seems to be a skill or training issue. So if you do a large number of these procedures, you get better. But there's a lot of people that make mistakes. Uh, sure. Early so what, ultimately, what you're trying to do is reduce complication, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, a, a neural cut. Yes. And so the I guess. If all you were to do is demonstrate that you can visually separate the tissues, uh, that's that's okay. But ultimately, what you want to do is show a reduced complication rate, right? Yeah, but that's good to be able to put it on. Well, what if you were to do dissection uh, in live animals, with and without the imaging? So basically, you set a you set a task. I don't know whether it's a femoral nerve that make somebody work around or just some sort of sur an actual surgery on an animal where you can say at the end those those procedures performed with the imaging had a much lower rate of uh, incursions across a nerve than, than without. Is this something you kind of turn on and off? Yes, it's just a, a hyperspectral imaging thing. So we have light shining at different colors and then we are applying with a, with a camera. That's basically it. What they were doing. We, we, we build the software, the method, and the hardware. So we have a you know, three level of uh, complexity. The, 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 uh, the method works, we test it in other samples, in other ways of collecting light, and you know, OCT actually in the eye, collecting in fluorescence, works very well. In reflectance, it does also work, test it with the retina.